Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to solve exercises 5 to 8 of chapter 1. Exercise 5, we consider the collection of all continuously differentiable functions on 0, 1, such that the integral of the square of f and the integral of the square of the derivative of f are both less or equal than 1. So we have to show that this collection is relatively compact in the space of continuous functions from 0, 1 to r. Okay, so the main tool is the Arzela-Ascoli theorem. So to prove that f is relatively compact, we have to prove two things. f is equicontinuous, and actually prove that in exercise 3, because this is a collection, a sub-collection of the collection of exercise 3. So, uh, and second thing is pointwise boundedness. So, so it could continuity, we did it in exercise 3. And the second point, which is not trivial actually, so we have to prove that calligraphic f sub x for every x in 0, 1 is actually pointwise bounded, because uh, the functions take value in R. So pointwise boundedness is equivalent to pointwise relative compactness. Okay. So now if you take any element small f in this collection, then the absolute value is continuous and therefore in particular it achieves a maximum. It has a maximum and a minimum value. So we are interested here in the in the minimum actually. You'll see why in a moment and not in the maximum. So modulus of f achieves a minimum value at some point x0, which depends on f. So we could call it x sub f, if you like, okay? because it may vary from function to function. And so therefore, by definition, when uh, I raise, to, so the modulus, the absolute value of f x0 is less or equal than the absolute value of f of t. And therefore, when I raise to the power 2 and integrate, this is a constant, it doesn't depend on t. Okay, So when I integrate, I get the absolute value of f of x0 is less or equal than 1. And now this is a bound which is the x0 varies in with f, but uh, its image under f is bounded from above by 1. So we have a kind of uniform bound here. Okay. So no matter what is x0, we always have f of x0 in norm in absolute value is less or equal than 1. And this is the key, actually, because now if we apply um, the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can write f of x minus, minus f of x0 as the integral from x0 to x of f prime of t. And taking absolute values, and if you apply the cauchy schwarz inequality that we used previously, we get the integral from x0 to x of 1 squared, which is just x minus x0 raised to the power 1 half. And since x and x0 are both in 0, 1, then, they're the, then their distance is also less uh, than 1. So this guy is less than 1. And the integral from x0 to x, uh, actually we should have taken here absolute value of the integral because you don't know if x is less or uh, than x0 or bigger than x0. Because, But anyway, uh, in order to simplify the notation. This is this integral is always less than the integral from 0 to 1, okay? because we are integrating something positive. So when the integral, the domain gets bigger, the integral gets bigger. So this guy is less or equal than 1. So f of x minus f of x0 is less or equal than 1, always. And therefore, by the triangle inequality, uh, f of the absolute value of f of x is less than absolute value of f, of x minus f of x0, which is less than 1, plus f of x0, which is less than 1. So get less than 2. So, and this is true for every f and for, for every x. So this means that calligraphic f sub x is bounded. It's contained in the interval minus 2, 2, if you like. Okay. So this is what I mean by pointwise bound. I didn't say it in the lectures, but this is a convenient way to say that f sub x is bounded. Okay, which is the same as saying that it's relatively uh, compact because we are working in R, in a finite dimensional space. Okay, so now the two conditions of the Arzela-Ascoli theorem are satisfied, and therefore we can conclude that F is 
relatively compact. Okay. Now it's not compact because it's not closed. And this is another question. So you can think of it actually, why it's not closed. Okay. Next exercise, we have two metric spaces X and Y and a sequence of functions f and from X to Y. And we assume that the collection of uh, Fn is equicontinuous at the point and that Fn of A converges to some element B. And now we have a sequence. We have to prove that if Xn is a sequence uh, in X converging to A, then the Fn of Xn converges to B. And this is not trivial, actually. So we have to show by an example that this result does not hold when the equicontinuity condition is removed. So it's not true for any sequence of functions. Okay. So, so pointwise point -wise conversions is not enough, actually. Okay. We need more. Okay, so under the equicontinuity condition, this is easy because we just apply the triangle inequality. So the distance between Fn, Xn, and B is less than the sum of these two distances. I introduce Fn, A. So Fn, Xn, Fn, A, Fn, A, B. Okay. Now, by assumption, what do we have? Uh, Fn, A, the distance, so Fn, A converges to B in Y. So this is this term converges to Z. And this term, this uh, first term actually, also converges to zero, but by equicontinuity. This is a consequence of the equicontinuity. Okay, because if you go back to the definition, you will get that for every epsilon positive, uh, the distance between fn of x and fn of y is less than epsilon provided x minus y is less than some eta. And so in particular, if we take n large enough, you will get the distance between xn and a less than delta. And therefore, the distance between their images is less than epsilon. So this term in general doesn't tend to zero in, uh, if you don't put an assumption of f on fn. So equicontinuity uh, forces this term to tend to zero. Okay, And therefore, this term tends to zero, and therefore fn of xn converges to b. So this is easy. Now I will show you by an example that we need this uh, equicontinuity assumption, because if you remove it, for example, take x to be 0, 1, a equals 0, y to be r, and fn of x to be 1 plus x to the power n, and the sequence xn, 1 over n, which converges to 0. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, how, so xn converges to 0. However, fn of xn, so first of thing, fn of, uh, fn of a is 1, so it converges to 1. But fn of xn is 1 plus 1 over n to the power n, and this does not converge to, to 1, actually. It converges to e, the exponential uh, number, so 2.7. Okay, so this is an example where this guy doesn't tend to 0. Okay, and what's wrong here, actually? What's, uh, the, what's wrong is that this collection, as you may check, is not equicontinuous. And, and this is, by the way, a proof that it's not equicontinuous because because if it were equicontinuous would have fn of xn should should have converged to to one okay so okay exercise seven uh, we have a metric space x and a collection calligraphic f of equicontinuous functions and we consider uh, calligraphic f sub x as usual and we consider the set of small x such that f of x is bounded. Okay. So first question, we have to show that a is open and closed. And we have to deduce then that if x is connected and f of x0 is bounded for some x0, then uh, we have relative compactness. Actually. So because this will imply that f of x is bounded for every x. So pointwise boundedness at a point will imply pointwise bounded at every point. And this is not always true, but we have actually here some extra assumptions. So we have the connectedness of the space. Okay, so how do we prove that A is open? Uh, so we prove that uh, for every X in A, there is a ball of center X and 
which is contained in A, or that equivalently A is a neighborhood of X, same thing. Okay, now if X is in A, then uh, F sub X is bound. So it's contained in some interval. This is a, so F, of F sub X is a, is a subset of R. So, so if it's bounded, then it's contained in some interval minus M. So the absolute value is less than a certain constant M. And this is true for every F in the collection. Okay, now if in the equicontinuity condition we take epsilon equal one, we find a number alpha or eta positive such that if the distance between x and y, this is actually equicontinuity at x. Okay, so alpha depends usually on x. So if the distance between x and y is less than alpha, then the distance between their images is less than one for every f in the collection. Okay. And therefore, by the triangle inequality, I get that f of y is less than 1 plus m for every y in this book. Okay. So this means that uh, calligraphic f sub y is bounded for all y in a neighborhood of x. So we proved that the ball of center x and radius alpha is contained in A, and therefore A is open, since x was arbitrary. Okay. Now, why A is closed? Uh, so we have usually two strategies to prove that a set is closed. Either we prove that uh, its complement is open, or we prove that it's equal to its closure. To prove that it's equal to its closure, we take a narrow element in the closure, and you prove that it's in A. So take X in the closure. Then, by definition, by uh, the usual, by the characterization of closure in a metric space, there exists a sequence X and in A converging to X. Okay. Now, as we said, by equicontinuity, there exists alpha such that this condition is true, the same one that we encountered before. Okay, so, and now, uh, since xn converges to x, then we can make the distance between xn and x less than alpha for n large enough, and, and therefore the distance between uh, f uh, xn and f of x is less than 1. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll use it now. And now, since x n, x n is in A, then calligraphic f sub x n is bounded by a constant that depends on n, actually. Now, I use this as I did before. So I have now, by this condition, f of x n minus f of x is less than 1. So by the triangle inequality, I get absolute value of f of x is less than 1 plus m n. Okay? And this is true for every f in calligraphic f. Okay? So this precisely means, so here we just fix uh, n, okay, we don't need to, uh, so just fix one n, fix it, and so we get calligraph, so we get f of x less than this constant for every f in calligraphic f. So this means that calligraphic fx is bounded, and therefore x is an a, okay? Now alternatively, you can prove that the complement of a is open, same thing. And now, can, if x is connected, then necessarily a is equal to x, because the only closed and open subsets of x are the empty set and x itself. But here, since a is not empty because x0 belongs to a, then we have to conclude that a is uh, the whole space, x. Okay? And therefore, uh, if calligraphic f is point is Pointwise bound at some point, then it's, point, it's pointwise bounded at every point. And together with the equicontinuity assumption, uh, this implies by the algebra Ascoli theorem that uh, calligraphic F is relatively compact. Okay. Last exercise. Uh, we consider the collection of continuous and bounded functions from uh, the infinite interval, zero infinity, into R. So here, unlike the usual cases where we take, took one, zero, one, or some compact set, here we consider a non-compact set. So here we have to uh, add the assumption that uh, the functions are bounded, because continuity here on an infinite, on a non-compact set, does not imply boundedness. Okay? We didn't put the condition of boundedness in the definition of C01, because every continuous function on 0, 1 is necessarily bound, okay? And therefore, we can uh, talk about the norm of uniform convergence or the supremum norm, which is just the supremum of f of x in absolute value, okay? And which is not necessarily a maximum, 
okay, because we, we don't have compactness here. And this is the point of the exercise. Okay, and we consider now uh, a sequence of, uh, of elements in this set E, which, such, which is defined by fn of x is the sine of radical of x plus n, n squared by square. And you consider the uh, collection, the image of the sequence, or the set consisting of f1, f2, and so on. Okay, so first we have to show that fn converges pointwise to zero. Second thing, uh, calligraphic f is pointwise bounded. Third uh, question, f is equicontinuous. Fourth question, the fn belongs to the unit sphere, if you like, of E. And we have to deduce that calligraphic f is not relatively compact in E, although it is pointwise bound and equicontinuous, and you have to say why this does not contradict the Arzela Ascoli theorem. Okay, so let us do this step by step. Okay, so sine n pi is zero, so fn of x minus zero in absolute value is this guy, and now according to the hint, sine a minus sine b is less than a minus b in absolute value, and I can drop the absolute value because this guy is uh, positive, so uh, this guy is bigger than this guy, so I can drop the absolute value because x is positive. And now, as you learned in school, you we multiply by the conjugate expression of this, so we multiply by a radical x plus n squared plus squared plus n pi, so when we simplify, we'll uh, get, get rid of the absolute value minus n squared plus, we get x, and of course this, as you know, converges to zero, but not uniformly, because, uh, well, I don't know if it's uniform, but anyway, it's pointwise, okay? because uh, we have the denominator tends to infinity. Okay, check that if, and uh, by the way, I don't know, but you can uh, try to answer this question. Is convergence uniform or not? Okay, second question. Since the sign is always between minus 1 and 1, so each fn is between minus 1 and 1, so uh, calligraphic f sub x is contained in minus 1. Okay, or so this means that point, this means pointwise boundedness, as we uh, called it. Third question equicontinuity, or actually we have uniform equicontinuity here, so we use the same trick here. Uh, sine a minus sine b is less than a minus b in absolute value. Here, we, don't, we cannot get rid of the absolute value because we don't know if x is bigger than y or y is bigger than x. But we use the same technique. We uh, multiply by the conjugate expression. And so when we simplify in the numerator, we simplify by n squared by square, so we get x minus y, but we have absolute values. And now, uh, this expression is bigger or equal than radical x and this expression is bigger or equal than radical y so the sum is bigger than radical x plus radical y so when i take the inverse i get less or equal than radical x plus radical y okay and now we can write x minus y as radical x minus radical y radical x plus radical y so we get a simplification and now it's very easy to prove that this quantity is less than this the square root of uh, x minus y in absolute value, okay? And we encountered this such inequality before. This implies uniform equicontinuity because we can take eta or alpha equal epsilon squared in the definition. Okay, so we have uniform equicontinuity. Fourth question, uh, the no, we have to prove that the norm infinity of fn, the norm of uniform convergence is equal to one. So how do we prove that? Double inequality. First uh, inequality is clear because the sign is uh, less is between minus one and one, so an absolute value is less than one, so the supremum is less or equal than one. Now, conversely, actually the supremum is a maximum here because you can simply take x to be pi over two plus two n pi squared minus n squared pi n squared n squared pi squared. And how where does this come from? Actually, because I want radical of x plus n squared pi squared to be pi over 2 plus a multiple of 2 pi. So if I solve this equation, I'll get that. Okay. 
and therefore when I take the sine, I get sine of pi over 2 plus 2 and pi, which is sine of pi over 2, which is 1. Okay, so the, mac the supremum is a maximum, and therefore I get the other, uh, because fn infinity is bigger than absolute fn of x, and therefore it's bigger or equal than 1. So we have double inequality, and therefore, okay. Uh, question 5. So uh, we have to prove that f is not relatively compact, although it is uh, equicontinuous and point to as bounded. So it is in by contradiction. If f is relatively compact, then every sequence of f, in particular fn, uh, would have a convergent subsequence that converges in the norm infinity, in the un so uniformly, to some limit f. Okay, but the whole sequence converges pointwise to zero. So in particular, the subsequence converges also pointwise to zero. Okay, so by uniqueness of limits, we have f equals zero. Okay, but by the previous question, f and k belong to the unit sphere. So the limit also must belong to the unit sphere. And so we'll get a contradiction because f is zero. So calligraphic f is not relatively compact. And, of course, this does not contradict uh, the aristotle Ascoli theorem because the underlying space is not compact. If you go back to the assumptions of the aristotle Ascoli, you will find that you are working on a compact space X. Okay. So, two assumptions on C. In the general form of aristotle Ascoli, we took X to be compact metric and Y to be complete. Okay. So, this concludes uh, this video and the exercises of section 1.1. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Stone-Weierstrass theorem. So, thank you for your attention, and see you next time.